Start. Got it. Yeah. And we do share them in our uh, YouTube account. So please, uh, if uh, you want to see one of the events you missed, uh, just go to our uh, YouTube account and you're going to be able to see all of them. Okay, so welcome again. As you know, we're going to talk about science communication today, and we have four really interesting speakers. So we have two that are more independent. So we have Anna that is actually doing this on her free time, science communication. We have Renaud, who is doing a podcast and also is a video creator, also independently. And then we have Sergio and Daimona, who actually work in an organization, and they do science communication in this organization. And we're going to start now uh, with Anna, and each of the speakers is going to have 10 minutes. And after all the speakers have their 10 minutes, we are going to have a Q&A session. So please stick around for the Q&A se session. And at any moment, you can write your questions in the chat, or sorry, in the Q&A, and then we will post them. Okay, so we're going to start with Anna. It's uh, Anna Kadit Pirsch. So he did her, she did her postdoc in MIT. And then uh, she moved to industry. She's now currently working in Moderna. And at her free time, she developed, she founded the Nonconformist Scientist. That is a platform that she tries to explain science, mostly COVID and vaccine related to the public in general. It's really nice. She makes a lot of videos. It's mostly in Portuguese, if I'm not mistaken, but it's really, really interesting. So we are very excited to hear from you. Thank you so much for your kind introduction. I'm going to share uh, my screen. I do have a short presentation. Okay, all good. Yeah, awesome. So uh, again, hi, my name is Anna uh, and uh, I was, uh, it was very nice to see uh, that I, I received this, uh, this invitation. I have been working with this project for around a year um, and I've noticed that uh, you know, people are kind of reaching out. So it makes me feel very happy uh, that the impact has been so, so positive. So for today, uh, uh, this, in this short uh, uh, presentation, the title is Fighting Misinformation with Empathy and how scientists can deliver a rigorous message to the community. I do believe that the scientists, we have an enormous responsibility because we know uh, what the majority of the, the community doesn't. So how can we use our knowledge uh, to do good? So I'm a senior scientist. Uh, I work in Boston. I arrived five years ago. Um, and I'm the founder and content creator of the, the, the Nonconformist Scientist, and you can find me as the NC scientist uh, on social uh, media, mainly on Instagram. Um, so the, the Nonconformist Scientist was a, was a project that started in, a, I started thinking about uh, launching the platform in June, uh, 2020. So this was kind of the, you, you know, the, the lockdown was kind of being released. Um, I'm still in the United States. I was not able to, to, to travel to, to Portugal since December, 2019. And I think that the pandemic was really hard uh, and in special for scientists, because we decided to stay where we are and in special the immigrated ones, because we do believe in our job. And this was what I did. I decided to stay in the United States to continue doing my job. And in June, when the lockdown started to release, I thought, OK, I have this idea in my mind. And you know, you could not still uh, use your weekends to travel. Uh, so I decided to use the time, the free time that I had, uh, to build this project that was in my head for around two years. Uh, since then, the, the NC scientists grew a lot. Uh, nowadays, we have more than 5,000 followers. Um, and, uh, you know, more than numbers, because I do not care much about the numbers that they, they mean. It's about the people that I'm able to, to inspire and to actually educate and inform uh, with these special uh, topics. So the anti-scientist was built to empower women in science, 
to share the life stories of women in science. So I created She Has a PhD. I'm going to show you the, the teaser that I did uh, in the beginning of, of this year, because I, I do believe that, uh, you know, women in science, we are more than the publications and the grants that, that, we, that, that, that we get. We have a story and that the story needs to be shared to the young generation. So I want to help creating the next generation of female scientists because I do not want to see uh, girls in science to, to just give up too early. And uh, even if you decide to, to immigrate, if that's your decision, I think that's, that's very powerful. So, th so the message was, how, how, how can I help? How can I create a platform and tell girls in STEM that they, they can be successful and they can actually be able to, to do it. And the other project uh, was to rethink the way postdocs and scientists would be able to connect with companies. I did a project at MIT, I was trying to, to launch a startup and then this was completely gone uh, in the NC scientists just because women in science was taking uh, an important part of my time. And then there was the pandemic. So I think uh, in, uh, this was by the end of September and uh, in, in October. And I think like everyone remember the amount of fake news and misinformation that were spread uh, all over the globe. So, you know, that we have like five, I, I received message from people and, and some of them actually educated, you know, confirming that an, an, uh, an mRNA vaccine wouldn't have a, a 5G chip. And I was like, look, you know, how maybe we want to do, that's just not possible at the nano size to, to do that. But people were getting completely crazy. And this happened not only because the way uh, journals and, and social media was being used to release this news, but also because there was an enormous uh, lack of consistency in the way the message was released. And just to explain that, I have here um, a new from uh, March 3rd, 2020 from the World Health Organization, you know, just pretty much saying that, well, this does not appear to, to make people sick. It doesn't seem to be worse than the flu. Um, you know, there are still not uh, vaccines and, and treatments, but you know, let's see, we are going to try to do to contain it. And they were not able to contain it. And I feel like this initial message that was sent by these high, governmental associations was wrong. The, the population, since the beginning that the pandemic, that the population gets the, the, the kind of the wrong message. And then again, you start to see a lot of these myths about the vaccines, that you would get sick with a COVID vaccine, that the vaccine would alter your DNA. And so I realized, uh, talking to my parents, that if my parents were confused about the message, if they did not know in Portugal where to look for an accurate website, because I can tell them to go to the EMA, to the EMA page or to the Infarmed page, but it's really complicated for them to, to understand, right? So if I realized that if my parents was, were not able to find the, the, the information, that I needed to, to do something. And this was what I did. So in October, 2020, I launched, this was one of the first posts of the NC scientist. It was called Three Minutes of Science. And in this post, uh, this is what is written here. Have you thought about how much can you learn in three minutes? Science, education, and communication for everyone. So what I did with this post, I put it on Instagram and I put it on LinkedIn. And I wanted to build uh, a team of people to help me creating short videos to explain in an in a informed way, in a very evident way, the science behind the pandemic. And I got dozens of messages. Uh, by the time the NC scientists did not have the number of followers that I have right now, but it did reach uh, a very nice uh, population. Um, the majority of them are my friends, of course, uh, but I did get a very impressive feedback uh, from people that were willing to help from the most diverse areas in science and science communication. So what I do believe deeply is that as a scientist, and I do have a lot of information, not that I know more than you do because the information that I receive is, is public information, but because I work on the field and I have such a deep expertise in nanotechnology, uh, of course I have the, the knowledge. And as me, there's many scientists in the field that have this knowledge. So here the, the challenge is, how are we going uh, to, to communicate this to, to, to the community? And uh, on the other hand, you know, for one side, I have the, the knowledge. 
And for the other hand, I, I really have the responsibility to share the knowledge that I have with the society. So this was the way that I found uh, to do it. I'm not a science communicator, and uh, or maybe I will be, I'm becoming a science communicator, but a big difference here is that in general, a science communicator is a person that has an, a general knowledge of science and it's, it's study and it gets educated to actually use very specific tools to communicate the science. And where I put myself is in the other side. So I'm a scientist. I do have a lot of knowledge, basic knowledge in the science, but I needed to improve my, my communication skills. And that's possible to do, and for sure that it's a pathway that in the future, I believe, many more scientists are going to be requested to, to bring their knowledge to, to institutions and, and to companies to help building this, uh, this uh, um, communication uh, field. So um, here it's, it's the science, the Science in Tres Minutes team. So this is, this is what I believe. It takes one person to have an idea, but it takes a team to, to build a project. So Science in Tres Minutes would not be possible to happen if I did not have these amazing people um, working with me. We started as a team of seven, right now we are nine, uh, but this is still the core. So we have uh, uh, Rita and Dora, so video and design. They are actually two science communicators. Joana is a medical uh, uh, writer. She works in regulatory affairs. And she's the person that helps us um, confirming that all the grammar is, is correct. Uh, Katerina is a postdoc in the Mount Sinai in New York City. She does an incredible job in the scientific research. So she's the one that goes to the nature papers, find the graphs in, in everything. Uh, so so we, we make sure that we have the, the best uh, uh, literature in our, in our videos. And then we have Felipe and Margarita. They are two PhD students that they are incredible, uh, helpful in, in the content. And uh, I'm kind of the director. I, I, I spent many, many hours of my free time building the videos just for you to have an idea. We spend like 40 hours per video. We talk about the three minutes and I record the videos and sometimes it takes me more than 20 times to be able to record the three minutes video that it's, it's perfect, like the ones we, we release. So this is just for you to, also, the message is, it's okay if you try to do something alone, but I think it's much more powerful if you can surround yourself by people that are going to be able to, to help you succeed. Um, here is kind of the Ciencia in Tres Minutos. This is the project, and this is the way we kind of sell it. In, this is our image. It's going to be tweaked next year, but this is the way we tell uh, people our, our message. We are you know, short videos in three minutes, and we are... The science is evident, is rigorous, and it's current. Um, so communication is a need. And what we decided to do was to use social media uh, to communicate science, uh, to contribute to inform uh, the community, and to fight misinformation. And if for, for one hand, uh, social media has the power to reach a lot of people. And, and nowadays, everyone is, uh, is on uh, social media. On the other hand, we know that it also has these advantages. So science communication competes in the same space in more appealing content. So, you know, I need to compete for the same space where people are posting recipes for muffins and bikinis. And believe me, I lose, okay? okay? Like science does not win when we, when we compete with other, with, other, um, with other people with very different content. When we do are able to make a difference is when we post hot topics. So right now it's variants, COVID tests and Omicron. So it's, it's good, it's good for science now to post about it because people are going to read and they're going to get engaged. But if right now you post and we, I have a, you know, we have a, com a community of science communicators, but if you post about kids' vaccines, it's not going to go anywhere. The algorithms do not work in our favor. And it's, it's something that we need to, to play and, and go around. And then social media platforms are also known to be one of the major sources of misinformation. So we are trying to compete in the same space uh, with you know, other platforms that try to, to share misinformation. And we want ours to be known that is evident and that is rigorous. So it, it's also kind of the other side of the coin as well. But I think that it's, it has been working um, 
very well in, in, in to, to your benefit uh, um, as well. So how do we build the, the, the video? So this is an extremely collaborative process and I'm just showing you this just for you to have an idea about what's the process behind uh, each, each three minutes video. So we do research, there's scientific literature, high impact scientific journals, original press releases from companies and official governmental and non-governmental web pages. So this is kind of what we use. And I have a lot of knowledge from what's happening in the United States with the FDA and I follow a lot of the hospitals, um, but in Europe is a little bit different and especially in Portugal I left so many years ago. So we have specific people that know the healthcare system in, in Portugal. We have a member of the team that is responsible to share with me all of the reports uh, from the DG DGS. Um, and so, so we get to know all of this accurate information. Then we, we organize the content, we kind of summarize uh, and organize everything. We do the lineup of what we are going to tell, and then we select you know, accessible language without losing the scientific rigor. Uh, then we review, so we need to ensure that we have uh, scientific accuracy, ensure that our language is adapted to the general public, and, you do, and we do grammatical review. And then we do the video and the design. So there's the visual production, we adapt the content to the video, we select the, the images, and then we do the, the voice records. So what has been so far our impact in the pandemic? I, I think it's small, but when I talk to people, actually the feedback that I have, it's actually making a difference. And it's, it's really good for, for a page that started, you know, such a year ago and, and without any type of uh, followers. So we released 10 videos in the pandemic. The majority, this was in the six months period, and we got more than 5,000 views. Even, I think that even more, but I think this is good. Um, and then outside social media, we were able to reach schools, universities, and pharmacies, and we got very positive feedback. So the next steps, we are now uh, expanding the content to other areas. Uh, we realize that the message we are able to, to release could be real powerful. So we just released our first video um, and this was during the antibiotic uh, resistant Awar awareness day. And it also got a very positive feedback. All the videos are in Portuguese and, and maybe, you know, if we, if we think about expanding the, the group uh, would be interesting to also explore other languages. So, you know, like I'm, I, I look forward to, to hear your, your feedback and especially if there's like some Portuguese here that are able to listen in the video, uh, just let me know. And, you know, if, if we get enough feedback that uh, makes it uh, kind of important to, to do it in English or in Spanish, we can also uh, do, do it. And now we are looking for grants and, and collaborations. And just to finish, I have here, um, this is the, she has a PhD, was one of the videos that I did. And I'm not sure if you're going to be able to see it, I'll try. Um, but this was one of the, um, the videos that I did for um, the Empowering Women project. This, I interviewed Patricia Herter. She's a CEO of Lindra, it's a biotech in Boston. She's amazing. And I'm, you know, in the last minute, I'm just going to show you the video. I hope you can listening. But Anna, if you don't just talk um, and let me know and I'll just share the, the, the link with you. I'm nervous, I have to say. <laughs> You are listening to She Has a Peace. My name is Anna, and my first guest is Dr. Patricia Herter. Thank you so much for being my first guest. It's a great pleasure having you for this conversation. What is your advice for helping women being more confident and speaking up? I think, you know, you kind of need people in your corner. You need a support network, you know, whether that be friends or mentors or, you know, maybe find a professor who's friendly and who can advise you and how to deal with certain situations. You know, you can't, you don't want to take it on your, yourself. You know, you really want to have people in your corner supporting you and then, then you can be, you know, stronger and, and more, you know, more resilient and take these setbacks a little bit more in stride. One of the things that the, a good mentor also told me when I, when I came to Boston was surround yourself by the best people and you'll be successful. Basically, you, know, you can only do so much in a, in a day, right? So this, if you only rely on yourself, you can only be have a successful, you can be in working 24 hours, assuming you know, it needs zero sleep, right? But if you have 100 people that are all awesome people that are all giving it their best and helping the company be successful, of course, you're going to be way more successful. So it really is all about the people 
that you work with and that are in your team and what you know making them feel really empowered and you know everybody everybody feels like they're working on an important problem they feel empowered to come up with solutions and their ideas and they've got you know the resources the support they need to make it successful then you're going to have you can have a successful team basically all right, so you can find more behind by this, the interviews on on the on YouTube. Okay, that's so great. just hmm? that's great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so just to, to finish, so last slide, some of you know some of the best, and I, I tell this a lot, is like some of the best projects are creating during the hardest times. And I feel like the non-conformist scientist for me was uh, was amazing um it's, it has been taught me so much like uh, it's the the first time that i i feel i'm uh, i'm building uh, my leadership skills and i'm actually able to to coordinate a team of people to work in the in the same direction so right now it's the the what, what i'm working more is in these two avenues so communication of science my instagram is loaded of covid19 and pandemic especially in weeks like this one uh, where people start to you know stop believing that the vaccines work uh, and it already proves so much that everyone was able to have a normal summer so you know it's like uh, again it's it's they are my nights and, and and i you know usually accept these talks during my lunch time or very early in the morning to share the project so a lot of science communication the majority in in, in portuguese and less next year i do hope to get back to she has a phd this was my baby. This is the project that I believe the most. I was only able to release a video because it's an enormous amount of work. It, it was days and days, um, you know, preparing for the interview, getting a, a pre-interview, an interview, and then organizing everything. I, I was, I don't have time to do this alone. So next year, I'm, I'll be looking for people to help me uh, continuing doing, uh, she has a PhD. Um, yeah, so, you know, thank you so much for your invitation. Uh, follow NC Scientist if you feel so. And, you know, shoot me an email if you need it. And, uh, yeah, all of these projects are, are online on, on Spotify uh, and, and, and YouTube. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Uh, it was super interesting, that project and all the other projects. You can actually share your um, links, social, on the chat if you want with everyone. Uh, now we're gonna hear uh, Renaud. So Renaud, it's actually a great pleasure for me to introduce him. Uh, that's a friend of mine since a couple of years now. And um, so he's going to show his uh, non-conventional but really interesting path. Uh, so he's an independent science communicator, uh, audio video creator, and the co-founder of a really famous podcast that's called The Learning by Bet. So please, uh, Renaud, uh, I'll let you introduce uh, your career path and your projects. Perfect. So thank you. Sorry if my voice is sometimes going off. It's because I got a cold this weekend. So I hope it's not because I've done too many podcasts. It's just because it's cold in Paris. Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I ask, Clarice, do you want to share the link or should I share it? I'm not sure I'm... I can share it. Okay, perfect. So for the people in the chat, um, Clarice is going to share you a link. You can just go there. I don't know, dig around and everything. You have a bit everything I will tell today in these 10 minutes. I, I just prefer just to talk and having uh, the faces uh, around me. But everything I'm going to say is there. And if you need any extra information, there is the project uh, I'm working on because uh, being a freelance is quite being um, uh, in several projects and sometimes it can be a bit uh, messy uh, to to remember all the name of the project and everything but to start with i think uh, i should just try to define what is my job uh, freelance in science communication is really broad definition it's it's really not something really specific there are some people that actually just are doing consulting there are people that are uh, doing some uh, video uh, editing stuff like that um, what i'm considering myself as a science communicator sometimes i'm saying that i'm science facilitator uh, because i consider myself as a scientist first because i have a phd and i still work a lot with science and deep primary uh, bi bibliography of science uh, but I'm also a communicator now that is dedicated to support research and researcher. 
uh, in different ways. Uh, I think I'm helping for what I'm doing. I'm helping uh, research to be produced and disseminated. This is what I'm looking for. So to do so, what I'm doing is I work with researchers or institutes to create valuable audio and video content to promote the research, the life of researchers, or to just help each other to grow in their career. And this is what is about the Lonely Piper podcast, but I will come to that. Um, so um, you will see that, I, I, so I will start, I think, uh, in my PhD, because you will see that a lot of things I'm going to say will resonate with what I've said, Anna. And I think because there are some kind of, uh, I don't know, convergence, convergence uh, evolution on there, that is that it's that, um, yeah, your time is limited as a researcher, your time is limited. And then therefore, when you go to another job, your time is limited. So uh, when I was in a PhD, I just wanted to do science communication because I just wanted not to feel alone in my lab, share my science and feel useful to society. So this is at this time that I started to create some podcasts, some video, doing some science communication events, like going in bars, talking to people, you know, maybe you know about the Pint of Science uh, uh, Festival. Uh, that's a really good start if you don't know where to start. Uh, so I was just doing this around and I was just learning by doing this, you know, I was learning to do video editing. I was learning to interact with other people, with other domain. I was able to to compact uh, i don't know four years of research in 10 minutes talk in a in a bar so this is how i started to get my skills uh, around this without having a diploma so when i arrived at the end of my pg uh, it was a pg in a, a pathway epigenetics so it was understanding how uh, a bacteria is able to uh, modify the way uh, the genes of infected cells uh, are read uh, or red, sorry. Uh, so at the end of this, I was like, okay, my only way to get out of the research or is either stay in research or to go in, I don't know, deep tech uh, science stuff or I don't know. But I really wanted to do science communication, you know, but um, it's quite complicated to make a job about it. It looks like there is some, I don't know, uh, job around, but you don't have a diploma, you're just having a PhD. Either you you know how to sell yourself or you don't. So I was having a lot of questions at the end of the PhD. I was just really lost. So what I've done is the next day of my PhD was just to ask for help. Uh, so the next day I just called one of my mentors, which is actually the co-host of the Nonly Pipette. Uh, his name is uh, Jonathan Weissman. He's teaching epigenetics in Paris. I just called him saying like, hey, please, can we have a coffee? I need to talk and ask you a question. I'm just completely lost. I don't know where to go. Um, so we, we, we settled around the coffee and the next day we started to discuss about my question about uh, am i doing a good job being a researcher should i go looking for several mentors where should i go should i stay in france or should i go outside of france so and he was telling me it's it's complicated question and it's complicated answers and he he, he just started to also convince me that also has a most more advanced scientist he was like I have also some question. Am I a good mentor? Um, should I, should I, I, how can I say that? Am I asking the right question for my team? I am, am I dri dri driving this team to the good direction? Uh, so it was like full of question about not science specifically, but how we do science. And so at the end we were like, okay, so let's try to find if there is any answers about that. And because we didn't find anything, we decided to to just create this resource. So this is how the Lonely Piped was created the next day of the PhD around a coffee. So I think the, the first thing you should learn from that because you will see how it helped me later to create my career now, is that you should rely on your frustration and your question, I guess, um, to build your path. Because if you feel that this is helpful for you, I believe that somehow in the world you have another person has the same problem than you. So if you don't find a solution or you create the solution, you should share it. So this is how the, the, the podcast was created. So we started to do this podcast. It's actually, it's not something that we are paid for. This is a resource that is free and it takes a lot of our time. Uh, but it started to create a portfolio for me. It started to create connection, create 
cre creating some some kind of you know story to to give to people around also with my previous work in science communication which where uh, i was doing before during my phd um, video competitions so i was using competition to give myself a short time uh, short uh, uh, space of time i don't know the the the, the, the word but you know what I mean? A short time, learn a new skill to apply for and have a content at the end. And so with this contest, I was always able to win, I believe, uh, because even if I was not winning the contest, I had a new content to put on my portfolio, a new skill learned on few months, something like that. And at the end, even if you don't win, you're going to the, to the, the prize uh, party and you're going to meet a new network that can help you, teach you and, and bring you forward. And I believe this is the this combination, I believe, because I, I still it's early in my career. This is this combination that bring me uh brought me where i am today uh so of course you know that in 2000 um yeah 2020 we have the we had the covid crisis i guess <laughs> so uh i started also during this time because in france so i was unemployed uh i was supported by something that we have here in france called pole emploi and I was using this time, this free time, to recreate my content and try to network and apply to job. All the jobs that I've applied just either cancelled me because of the COVID, or they 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 took we they took me. We we went super forward together, and at the end they say, well, short of money, guy. We, we cannot go forward. So it was really frustrating. So at that moment. Um, I just started to do some after work and, and dig around. And one person just heard of me because of my work of the Lonely Pipette, because of my work on the, on the contest before. And he was actually the director of the minister of the Department of Science and Society Relation in the Ministry of Higher Education and Research. So this ministry just called me, told me that they were looking for someone to support one of the festival uh, of France uh, for science, which is called the Fête de la Science. And so I decided to took the job. It was just a supporting job during the COVID. I was far away from producing content for what I am doing right now, but it, it, it gave me also another per perspective of what are the actors of the people working in France in science communication. And it also gave me extra time to prepare my future projects. So I spent there eight months during the COVID. And this year in February, 2021, I, because I was preparing uh, to launch myself as a freelance, I decided to jump in this uh, um, adventure, uh, still being worried if this is going to work or not. Uh, but I just decided to jump on that because I, I believe that given the reception of the Lonely, uh, Lonely Pipette podcast and the reception of another the, the next um, project, the next project I'm going to tell you, I just thought that uh, I should just go for it. So uh, at the to when I started to 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 jump uh, on this story, on this adventure, I have do I I did exactly what Anna did. It means that just surround surround myself by people that I don't know if they are better than me, but actually they are doing other stuff than me, of course. So they are better than me. <laughs> but it's just like uh, finding the people that are synergic with you, knowing how to do something that you don't know, you can create better content. I mean, Tana, Anna told you that, and this is how uh, I end up there. Uh, the Nandi podcast, uh, the Nandi Pipette podcast, um, it's Jonathan has a really good skill to interview people. He has a really good connection with the researcher. I am good at editing audio and create a narration around, around it. So we decided together. Um, and so when I started in February, February, I decided to reach media and just try to just spontaneously told them, hey, I'm creating content. I know a network of researcher. I know how to speak with them. I know the limited time they have. But I'm able to transform this knowledge in something, a story that you should, you, you will be interested in. So I started to apply there, just, you know, sending, I didn't apply it to job, but I just sent several projects that I've written myself, podcasts, stuff like that. 
And uh, some of them replied, like there is the Science Heavy magazine, which is a very, French, a very famous French magazine in France. I decided to go with me to create a podcast about how science is helping um, uh, investigation when you have a crime scene. Um, so, so on and on, I met other people and other people, and I'm, I was building a kind of small portfolio of different people in science communication, media, institutes, and researcher that were giving myself, uh, giving me the, their trust and their time to produce this content together. Uh, so now about, this is produ pro this production of contents for uh, other uh, magazine. It's probably, I guess, half of the time of my work because half of another uh, yeah, half of the time of uh, my work is to 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 drive with another creator a huge project that was thought before uh, I decided to jump in the freelance uh, uh, story, and this uh, work is called uh, Cell Words, and uh, so maybe uh, so in the link you have some visual of that, but maybe I can send you one. I can just share now one of the visual because it will it will it will just tell what i'm doing so i don't know if you're seeing it right now but if yes, yes. here we go so this project is really one of my main projects and to do that i've just met by doing life science uh, not life science, I like in the lab, but live Twitch of science and videos. I've met another creator that was coming from uh, also the microscopic area of research. Uh, I am I, I come from microbiology and he, he come from uh, no science. And we were like, you know, this COVID crisis, I mean, every time we speak about, you know, microscopy, it's always in bad, but it, it's not the fault of anyone. It's just like we we just talk about it where, 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 when there is a need to talk about it. When we tell to people around us, DNA, bacteria, virus, it's always negative. I mean, it's it's always negative because there is a reason and we the media cover them when there is a urgence, there is a health issues or there is something like we're afraid of because being afraid is a really strong emotion. It's a really strong. Uh, but another emotion that is also driving people to want to know more, it's wonder. It's how, how to put sparker in their life. And so we, we decided like, why we don't take all those images as microscopy scientists that we are. Um, how, why we don't ask researchers of their images of, uh, that are taking the dust in their storage drive. And we create a, real, a really beautiful uh, story, a wonderful story about this world that we don't know, but is absolutely stunning. Uh, because it's not always in the negative that you can see it. You can also discover processes that help industry. You can also discover a process that help food uh, industry and food, food treatment. Um, there's a lot of good stories there too. And it's also our job to communicate the good side of microscopy. So we decided to do that uh, just based on our frustration that all the images that we have, the three the free gigabytes of uh, images, they are just taking the dust there and they don't have any place in a paper. So why we don't put them in places where they are never going to, to be? So this is how we created the Cell Worlds project, which is an uh, art and science project with several works. One of them is a documentary uh, that will take all the codes of the, uh, you know, immersive documentary in the in the forest and everything to tell a story about what is a cell, what it is doing, is it moving, is it interacting, is it exchanging information, all these basic concepts that we can put in video and they are just wonderful to watch. And uh, by doing this, we hope that people reconnect with the microscopy in another way than just being afraid and just wants to know more about all the processes that there is behind. Uh, and so in the, in the way of creating this uh, project, I'm going to stop the sharing now, in the way of, of creating 
these projects, uh, we've just contacted one of uh, uh, the biggest uh, museum, just randomly, Museum of Art, uh, Numerical Art Center here in, in Paris, which is called Atelier des Lumières. So this is a huge structure where you have, uh, you, you, you just, you have walls like uh, 10 meters uh, high and you're just walking in a, in a place where they project art and they project paintings and everything. We just contacted them saying that, uh, we have good images, nice images, and we have a good story. And we believe that we can put those images there because the the people that go in art, in this kind of art center, center, it's not that they don't care about science. It's just that they are more attracted to this kind of aesthetic, uh, this kind of art. And so if we just speak their language, we put the images there, but we drag them to, to learn more about those images, this is mission accomplished. So this is where we decided to collaborate with them to create a show that will be, re, be released uh, next year. Uh, so this is 200 square meter of projection. This is high, high, uh, it's eight meter high uh, structure. And this is just 360 degree. So where you are emerged in this world and the purpose will be just to create enough curiosity, enough wonder to drag them then to see the documentary. So we connect the works so they can just fulfill the same purpose, just speak the good language to, to bring the good information. So I will probably finish by saying that this is really what my work is driving me now. I really believe that we should just use emotion, how use are so powerful to, to attract and keep the attention of people. We should put the emotion to the service of information. And we believe that this project is going to answer this. We hope it will work, of course. Uh, but until now, we are working with several institutes. I mean, we have a 24 research team around the world. Uh, we have about 10 to 12 different topics. And it's just one, two, I mean, this is just a double piece of art we are starting, but we really believe we can go more ahead by creating more immersive shows, speaking about other topics, like we can talk about epigenetics, we can talk about cancer. We can, can you imagine that we could maybe talk about cancer, not in a way only on the disease, but just attracting people to learn more about how a cancer can emerge just by looking first uh, uh, at how this is beautiful. It's not to 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 hide the 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 kind of I mean the the negative and the the, the true uh, sad story of cancer, but this is just another way that we can talk to people and do more preven prevention and to to give them more information. Um, I guess I should stop here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That sounds amazing, though. I'm looking for the exhibition. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now I'm going to introduce our third speaker, that's Sergio, and uh, Sergio Prancinha. And this is kind of a new thing because it's a uh, Sergio is actually a geologist. So that's something pretty cool because we usually keep the biologists. So thank you very much and for accepting our invitation. We are all up for diversity. So Sergio did his PhD in Imperial and then he went to do a postdoc in Portugal. And then he started as an associate project officer at UNESCO in the section of um, art sciences. So we are very interested in seeing what you have to share with us. So um, hi, everyone. Um... And thank you for, for the invitation. It was uh, quite unexpected because um, I have to confess that I didn't know about the network, despite the fact that I, I studied and lived for uh, quite a long time in London and I did part of my studies in the UK as well. So thank you very much for that. And uh, yes, it is true that um, geology is not the most, um, I would say, sexy, science uh, for some reason it's been um, um, uh, most of the, uh, the science communication that you see is from the is related to life sciences um, it, the reasons are quite obvious right i think uh, Renaud mentioned the fact that um, people being afraid is a very good motivator for uh, people searching for information so uh, I mean, we all get sick, right? We all get illnesses, so it's quite normal that uh, things which are related to uh, life sciences are much more, 
I don't want to I don't want to use the word easy because that would make it sound bad, but they are easy to sell in a way. They're easier to sell. They're they're more um, it's easy to engage people when they are motivated for it. It's much harder to engage people when you're basically talking about um, well, rocks, which is <laughs> which is what geologists do, right? Um, I, I would just I don't have a presentation. Um, I mean, I, I was. A bit, I think we were all a bit tired of uh, webinars and things like that. I, I myself have been working from home for the past almost two years, although my headquarters are uh, in Paris, in uh, UNESCO's headquarters in Paris. But uh, well, COVID has always sent us home, so we've been working from home. I'm in Lisbon at the moment, and uh, I can't really count the number of webinars and. Uh, talks and online meetings that I've attended and well organized many of them. So I, I would just like to kind of share a, a slightly different experience, uh, although there has some connections, particularly with Renault's um, path. So um, communication is particularly geoscience communication has been something that I've been connected with uh, pretty much since I, I was a child. Uh, the main reason being that my dad's a geologist, my mom's a geographer, so I ended up kind of, I grew up in a geo house, so to speak. And then from a very early age, when I was still in high school, I, we had a paleontology club down at the school that I um, attended, and we started from a very early stage to participate in the first uh, events that uh, Ciencia Viva, which is the uh, Portuguese government agency for uh, science uh, awareness and science engagement to the, to the public, we we participated in, in the in the first ones, and that is in 1997. So probably many of you <laughs> don't really remember 1997, but uh, I am old, so <laughs> I was there in 1997 participating in these science uh, communication projects. They were basically taking science to schools and to young uh, students, uh, which would then present their findings and the things that they were doing in science in their classrooms to, uh, to a global audience. Um, these were interesting because they were done in, um, in schools with, uh, with teachers, with lecturers from, from, these, small, from these schools. So, uh, you can say that I've been doing science communication informally since a very young age. Then, I mean, I can say that I had a really common path, uh, went to university, studied geology, uh, ended up, instead of going to academia like many people do, I, I had some luck, uh, I would say, and I ended up in a northern gas company which took me three years to uh, Brazil. I worked, my career actually started working in uh, oil rigs. Uh, that's where I, st I worked for uh, two and a half years of my life. Um, and then I moved back to Lisbon where I was well, uh, research and development scientist uh, in, a, in an oil company, uh, which then led me to do a PhD uh, for a few years in London. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see how there's, there is a common thing in, in many people who do PhDs and end up doing uh, science communication, which is um, people start doing science communication because they're tired of doing science, uh, of doing science as uh, being in a lab or, or, or having to uh, write papers and um, working in the uh, uh, publish or perish uh, environment. And there's a lot of people, I, I mean, I remember this, from many of my colleagues uh, saying that academia no more. They would, not, they, they would not want to go to academia. And actually most of my colleagues from the PhD time, they're not in the academia anymore. And that kind of tells you a bit about, and I think this is important in, uh, as a topic in science communication is because science is mainly done in academia. So it is kind of, it's probably important for us to think about uh, why academia is, uh, is why there are so many people moving away from academia uh, and, and trying to find other, other jobs, uh, still science related, but not wanting to be in academia. 
So uh, I, I finished my PhD already with the feeling that, well, maybe I really don't want to be a full-time scientist working in academia, writing papers and having to go through all the, uh, every year, the same process of finding funds of being, um, well, with, with scholarships and bursaries all the time. And um, despite that, I finished at a time which was quite complicated for the industry that I was working on because I was working in a carbon storage, carbon capture and storage, which although it is a technology related to uh, mitigation of climate change, it is also connected to, uh, to oil and gas. So at the time, it was the, well, one of the many oil and gas crisis uh, ups and downs and um, at the time they were firing many, many people. There was a very, very high unemployment rates in the oil and gas industry. And I'm talking about companies firing thousands of people uh, per week on a weekly basis. Uh, companies like Schlumberger were firing, I don't know, I think they fired like something 5,000 employees in a year or two. So uh, I came back to Portugal because obviously you can't be without a job in London. I think you, you understand this. Uh, and um, ended up doing a, um, a, postdoc, a postdoc in uh, geothermal energy. And at the same time that I was doing that, uh, a bit like Anna, I kind of like felt, well, I mean, there's stuff going on which, are, uh, ge which is geoscience related. And at the time, that, that geoscience related issue was about lithium mining in Portugal because this is related to energy transition and to uh, electrical, electrifying the economy, electrifying all aspects of our, of our life so that we get rid of uh, fossil fuels. Um, and I, I had written an article in one of the, the Portuguese newspapers for, I mean, in, a, in a supplement of the paper, in a, in a bit, in an online part of the, of the newspaper. And then I decided, well, I'm gonna, try and throw it up to the uh, editor of the newspaper and see if they publish it in the main newspaper. And I just sent the email uh, without being very confident that they would publish it. And uh, one day I was uh, at home working actually, and I get a phone call from my auntie and say, so you published an article on the, uh, on the newspaper and you didn't tell us. And I was like, what, what, what article? And so it happens that they did publish my article on, uh, on, the, on the newspaper. It came in paper actually on the in the economy uh, section and that kind of created a buzz around what I had written because it was a bit of a I kind of I think that I kind of shake it shakes the uh, the uh, wasps nest because things started to move and then I funny enough I, I was the target of some of the of some environmentalist groups who uh, well, made some memes with my face. Uh, I mean, all sorts of things that happen on social media that you may imagine. And this is a very interesting thing because it's very different from what happens in many of the life, sci uh, life sciences communications because um, whereas people who communicate uh, in life sciences are generally perceived as being on the good side, People who communicate in earth sciences, especially people who are connected to um, resources exploitation, being uh, oil and gas or mineral resources or whatever, you say normally we are perceived as being part of the problem because we are on the side of industry. So long story short, the fact that this created the buzz, I ended up being invited for a few talks um and then um well things happen in weird ways um unesco had a vacancy uh which i applied to and uh, ended up doing science communication at the uh, earth sciences of unesco now my work is slightly different from renault and anna because uh, i'm in an institution uh, right uh I'm not, and there's rules that I need to follow. There's things that I can't, can and they cannot say. So our, our work, I would say, it's mainly based on um, being at the earth sciences uh, section. What we do is mainly to 
try to convey the message that, um, well, geology and earth science is, is at the base of everything that we do and all the objects that we use on a daily basis. So I can well, we're basically using uh, computers to talk, computers, actually everything you see around you, if you, if you look around you, everything has geologists in, in its path. So there's no way that anything you have uh, at the moment, every object, every service that we use, needs a geologist along the way in normal and usually along the way is right at the beginning because that's how you create that's how you produce raw materials that's how you then process these raw materials and create all the objects that we use so this is one of the messages that we try to convey so this is the, ba the big uh, umbrella that we use then the other thing is uh, the fact that um, there's a geo heritage in the world that we need to preserve and using that is the way to educate people and to um, take people near the closer to the to understand the planet that they inhabit so the, this this these are the two main ideas that we that we try to to convey through our 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 communications now i would say a normal day in my in my work is manage several several um, social media networks, write a lot of content for UNESCO's websites, um, briefings, press releases, and uh, as something that I really enjoy doing. It, it's, I think it's quite different from uh, what I've heard so far. It's to write speeches. So I, I write speeches for uh, the uh, system director general, uh, briefings for 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 her speeches basically, and then I, I produce the usual contents that you produce on an institution: newsletters, uh, social media, website articles, a lot of uh, talks, a lot of webinars, a lot of uh, engaging with uh, hundreds of partners around the world. Uh, we manage the um, UNESCO. Uh, Global Geoparks, which is a network of 197 territories. So there's a lot of people, there's a lot of partners. So that's pretty much it. And I would say that my message, and I don't want to take much time, is that a career in science communication can start pretty much whenever you want. Uh, it, these days, there are already quite a lot of masters in, in the subject. I think pretty much every university which has sciences and social sciences has a master's in science communication. I was doing one of the master's in science communication um, in 2019, which I've never finished because there's simply no time for that. Um, but to be honest, I, I think that if you have a knack for it, if you like doing it, if you enjoy doing it, um, well, just start doing it. And um, I mean, these days as, as is, as everyone can see by Renault and by what Anna demonstrated, we have the tools to uh, start communicating ourselves. Uh, the only uh, advice that I would give to anyone who wants to start a career in science communication or anyone who's already doing it is that not to treat the audience as uh, you would treat uh, ignorance. Um, the deficit model, which has been used for many, many, many years, which is basically we own the knowledge and we pass it on to you uh, in a in a one way, doesn't work anymore. So it's it, I know it's hard sometimes because we hear a very we, we hear many stupid things. We have we hear many uh, things which are uh, brute, which are ignorant, which are uh, aggressive, but. In my view, there's nothing to gain out of um, making the audience hostile. So, and usually people who are denialists or being anti-vaxxers or climate change denialists or uh, extreme environmentalists, because they exist as well. Um, people who think that we can live in a, in a unicorns and uh, uh, rainbows world without changing the environment that we live in. Um, normally these people are very few, but they are very loud. In most studies regarding uh, science communication, what comes out is that these represent, I don't know, one, two, three, four percent of the audience. 
but they make so much noise that we spend most of our time talking to these people. And that's not what, what that's 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 not a good thing. We need to talk to the other audience, the ones who, which are uh, willing to learn, which the ones which are really, uh, willing to debate and are open to it. And so that would be my advice at the end: would be to focus your efforts on people who actually want to hear and people who actually want to debate with you, and not with people that basically want to hear themselves shouting and are looking for attention. And uh, which, and in and that's the biggest challenge when we're using social media and digital tools because we do not know who's on the other side. We have a lot of people, but still, it's it's it would be my my main advice. That's my uh, five cents to the to the uh, to the debate. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sergio. It was really interesting point of view. And thank you for your core breath. I think they are, the three of you, really, really inspiring. Uh, and this is really probably, this is helping me and this is probably helping lots of people that are thinking, uh, changing maybe path and maybe in science and communication. Because publish or perish, I think, does ring a bell for every single researcher. <laughs> thank you so much. So now the last speaker, but not least, uh, Diamona. I, yeah, thank you. Can so you hear me okay? Can hear you okay. So Diamond Akonde, thank you so much for accepting the invitation again. Uh, so um, we are really lucky to have you. She has a broad experience in science communication in different charity and um, institution like Cancer Research UK or Welcome Trust. So we are really looking to hear from you, from you and your prof. Thank you. Um, so I'm Daimona um, and I've been a press officer at Cancer Research UK for about three years now. Um, I want to first thank the London Postdoc Network for inviting me to speak today. And I thought I would start with um, telling you a little bit about how I got into science communication um, and then the positions that I've held so far and what it's been like to work in it. And I hope that will be helpful. So it started, I moved to the UK about 13 years ago to study genetics in Cardiff. And then I did a PhD in London at Imperial in their White City campus, if any of you are familiar with it. And it was during my PhD that I first, that I became sure that I was going to try and go into science communication. It wasn't a surprise because I always loved talking about science sharing sort of my passion and I love it when someone is curious and when you talk about science and someone goes wow you know that moment when you you explain something or you tell them something that they were interested in or perhaps thought that was not for them um, but there are other reasons as well um, I'm sad to say that research culture was one of them um, Sergio just talked about publish and perish and that was very much part of that although I hope this would have evolved positively since then. But the main one was just, I saw that the end game of a career in academia, which would be being a PI, wasn't actually something that I would have enjoyed doing. I love doing the science myself. And I thought I'd love to do a postdoc because I like to do the research, but actually it's taking me towards a place where I don't want to go. So from there, I thought, well, how do I go about it? Because there's not really a blueprint about going into science communications. There are a lot of masters now, but I wasn't as aware of them back then and also didn't really want to do another degree. Um, but what I first tried to do was to start, take every opportunity that I could to volunteer and join projects um, in science communication, not unlike what Anna told us about and founded, so I joined a project called Native Scientist, which was aimed at um, inspiring children whose first language isn't English into science. So we'd go into schools and talk to kids about our work in our native language. So I'm French, so we went to the French schools. And it was really eye-opening. And also kids are a tap crowd. <laughs> they ask you know, they have a short attention span, they ask a million questions, and it was really great. And I also joined the um, British Science Association. They used to have 
volunteer branches all around the country who organize science themed events. So little science talks or film screening with a debate or one time we did a Santa murder mystery where you had a little investigation to find out who killed Santa and we actually, some of them were silly little games, but we also invited people who I believe were some from the police um, with a machine to analyze the residue found at the crime scene um, for people to get familiar with that process and just understand that part of the process. Um, and that reminded me a little bit of what Renaud mentioned earlier with Pint of Science, that's something that anyone can start while doing the research. So that's really a piece of advice that I would give um, to start doing your research, because actually you've got the material right there and what you're doing is already great um, material from communication. And these really allowed me to learn from others who knew what they were doing or who had a really great idea um, into how to organize an event, publicize an event, um, speak in front of people, speak to different audiences, whether they're kids or adults. And that was really helpful. Um, and another thing that I did was I volunteered at the Science Museum during the Cosmonauts exhibition a few years ago. Maybe some of you are familiar with it or saw it. They had a lot of objects from the Russian space race. And that was completely different. It wasn't in my field because obviously I'm more in biology uh, and it was also very nerve wracking because it was standing in the exhibition all day and just sometimes people would ask me things, but it was also trying to start those conversations, which isn't really something that I was, that was my thing, let's say. And sometimes people don't want to talk and that's fine. But I found that sometimes starting this conversation would lead to something more and people would get more interested or they would get a better experience out of the exhibition. And it really helped getting out of my comfort zone. So that's something else that this, all of these volunteering during my PhD has helped me with is um, to see lots of different ways to do science communication. I would really encourage anyone who's interested about pursuing this as a key career to try different things. You'll find what you like and what you don't, what you're good at, or something that maybe you're not good at, but you want to get better at. Uh, and that's super helpful for your future. Then when I graduated, I would say the hardest part in my sort of path so far was finding that first job because there's a lot of competition. There are a lot of different profiles. There are people with PhDs. There are people with masters that are exactly in SciComm, which I didn't have. Um, and that was quite difficult. So I started with a what was actually initially a three month contract at the Physiological Society. They're a learned society of researchers in physiology. So if any of you are in that field, I really would encourage you to check them out. They're really supportive um, of researchers in the field, especially early career. And the job was originally um, to reorganize the website to make it more user-friendly for the researchers. So it really helped that I had a background in research because I had been the target audience, if that makes sense. So it's really important to understand if you're communicating to people, it's not about you saying what you want to say, it's about what do these people need? What do these people want? What are they interested in? And that helped. Um, but there was also something that I'd like to mention. They told me way afterwards that that helped me get the job, but I actually downloaded the content management system from their website to try and see if I could understand it, if I could work with it, if just to be more involved and know what I was talking about. And they told me way later, I, you know, you downloaded the thing. This was really impressive. We didn't expect this much. And that's something that I think is relevant because as I feel like researchers, the kind of profile of people who are in research, they go 100%. You know, you're used to knowing your topic inside out to push the boundaries of what you know. And I think this is an attitude that's actually really helpful to just go the extra mile to look for, to try and research, research the topic and know it inside out. And that's something that is really a skill that we have and that is really helpful and we should value it and cherish it. And it does help um, in that type of career as well, even if one is not into research anymore. And then if I tell you a bit more about the 
job that I had there, um, while I worked there and did reorganize the website, they told me, well, you know, we've got this Twitter, we don't really use it very much, we don't have time. So if you want, you can have a crack at it. And I did, and it went really well. So after three months became six months, um, they created a position for me of communications officer. And there I learned so many things. It was quite a small organization in terms of number of staff. So that meant working in social media a little bit, publicizing the press releases, editing blogs, going to conferences to interview researchers, scientists who were there. Um, I ended up doing some video editing, some filming to showcase profiles of researchers and careers in physiology. It was really amazing because it allowed me to learn a little bit of everything and also gain confidence in communication, creating strategies of how can we help our audience or members the best we can. So it is a little bit different from having one idea and one project that we do on our own to work within an organization because then they also of course have their own goals and their own strategy. But I really love doing that. Um, and after about a year and a half, um, I joined Cancer Research UK as a press officer. So I went from doing a little bit of everything to a lot of just one thing. Um, and there it was working with media almost uh, exclusively. So being in between media and researchers. And the goal was to publicize research that was funded by the organization. It was completely looking back to research. It was almost the opposite in that you had to take a piece of research and communicate in a really short and impactful way because my audience wasn't the public, let's say it was specifically journalists and they don't have time. So you have to convince them immediately why this story is important, why this story is impactful, why this story is interesting, relevant. Um, and you have to do that without sacrificing the accuracy because as someone with a science and research background, that's the one thing that I can't lose is, you know, we don't want to overhype stories. We don't want to say this is the cure when, you know, it's more nuanced than that in terms of the data or the stats. And that was really the big challenge when, when joining that organization. Um, but it really helped me again, um, learn how to communicate science efficiently, learn how to sum it up, get that understand that bigger idea, that bigger picture, um, and, I, and to work quickly with accuracy as well, which, you know, the deadlines are much different, I guess, from, from a career in research, but that's something that I've personally really enjoyed. Um, and I would say along the way, if I look back at this path, what's been incredibly important is the people. If I go back to the project that I volunteered with, whether it's um, Native Scientists, the British Science Association, I met people there who I still talk to today, who we still support each other. And I think, especially if you're doing this along another career, being a researcher, the people you'll meet are going to be the best supports and are going to be some of the most important relationships for your career. Some of these people are still my close friends and we send each other job offers and we hype each other up. Um, and that's been really lovely and important. So I would really encourage you to if through science communication work, you, you get to network with people, get to know them, that these are really relationships that you want to nurture. I'm saying that as a little bit of hypocrite because I'm terrible at networking. <laughs> and I know that when I was a researcher or going to conferences, that's always something that I found maybe quite difficult or awkward, um, but it really is worth it. And if I can end with one last piece of advice, which I have, but I think it would probably override many of the others. It's remember to put yourself first. It's, it's hard, and especially if you're starting another project alongside a research career that you already have, um, like some of the other panelists have done, that's fantastic work, but it's super demanding. And, you know, it's, it's okay to slow down sometimes. It's okay to know your boundaries so that you don't burn out. That's really the most important thing as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Diamond. It was 
really, really interesting. And thank you for sharing your personal feeling about your path and your career. Uh, so yeah, we don't have lots of time for creation, but it was really great to um, listen to your inspiring path anyway. So I think that was really useful for lots of people. And uh, thank you for sharing all your projects. It was really interesting. I'm going to look uh, to some of them really closely now. So let's check if we have some question in the Q and A. Or in the meantime, so all of you have already given quite a lot of advice and recommendations. One of them that is quite pop quite popular in common is networking. Is there any other burning advice that any of you would like to share with us? I can share one with me, one with you. Like for me, network. Uh, I mean, because my project is so different. This is not my career. I don't think this is, this is going to be my career one day. But for me, it's more about the impact uh, that the the knowledge that we have can can have in in the community and the people that we talk to. So you know, I think that net network. I mean, all of that can can of course beneficiate us as, as scientists and in our career. But for me, it's really about the impact we can have in, in others and kind of using science communication to, to do good. That's kind of my advice. Okay. And then... I, I can add something. Maybe it was not clear, but I, I just want to make it clear for <laughs> because I really believe that sometimes it's, it happens too many times. How many times, I don't know if they are going to answer uh, in the Q&A, but how many times have, have you find yourself uh, wanted to reach out someone, like we were talking about networking, wanted to reach out someone and ask him for a few minutes and you told uh, you, yourself, um, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And the next day you wake up and you say, yeah, tomorrow. And the, another day, yeah, again, tomorrow. So really uh, the only, the, the only, other advice that is really not scientific i just i just uh, i don't have tested but i really believe like you want to contact someone like at the end of this uh, workshop just reach one of the 10 person you want just do it just say hey do i have five minutes and you do it and then you you will see that if you ask people to talk about their their story usually they say yes they are interested to share their 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 story i don't know if this is a egocentric stuff or whatever but actually people love to to share what they have been through and if their story can help you just go ahead thank you Reno. yeah i think this is also one of the take on message from tonight is that you just do it like if you think it's a good idea if you want to contact this museum if you want to contact this society just do it like maybe people will not answer but most of them will <laughs> so yeah that's that's actually a great advice i like like that yeah don't sorry. be afraid. And also, sorry, I would say, um, don't be afraid to talk about your work to people that you wouldn't expect. I found that sometimes in the most unexpected places, you talk about what you're doing and like, oh, that sounds so complicated. And that could be the end of the conversation. But if you have a chat with that person, you realize that you can have a really interesting conversation with them. And it's maybe not that complicated. And by doing it regularly, I find that you just get used to it. And it's, I don't know, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. I had actually a question for maybe Sergio and you, Diamona. Uh, because you are working on an in institution, both of you, UNESCO, Welcome Trust, you are probably doing communication with people that doesn't have the research background, right? Doesn't have a PhD. Do you, do you, how do you feel like, do you feel that there is a competition, that they have better skills that you do? Uh, how do you compare? Like, how do you work together? Is it complementary? Uh, do you think we need both? Like people coming from a research background and people coming from a communication uh, degree background, if I can say that that way. So how do you feel like working the same uh, job, but in a really different, um, like from a different background? Should I start, Emma? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, firstly, let me just say that it was quite interesting to, to, to learn that you studied in Cardiff because I studied in Cardiff for a while as well. So uh, cool Cardiff. It's been a while. I probably wasn't there when you were there. It was, it was in 2004. So uh, yeah. it was, yeah. <laughs> Give me uh, class anyway. of 2012. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, what I would say, look, 
It, it is a very interesting question, and I'm glad that you've asked it because um, it's very different to work in um, communication behind the scenes in the sense that, for example, and this is not taking value of what Renault or Anna do, the other bit, the, the complete opposite. I think there's several um, places to communicate and, and they all have um, ups and downs. They all have each, each, each characteristics, right? Now, when you work in, in big organizations like I do, one of the big issues is that um, in any situation, communication is always the, the, the department or the section which is going to get be responsible when something goes wrong. Um, it's very easy to blame saying, oh, we didn't have enough attendees because you didn't communicate it well, or we, uh, this was not properly promoted, or the journalists didn't understand what you what the uh, purpose was because the press release were not, was not properly done. I mean, I could tell you loads of stories. The reason why it's because we all communicate, right? It's, it's what we are. We are communicative beings. We, communication is part of what we do as humans. We, we, we are born communicating, right? It's crying is nothing but communicating, a baby communicating to the humans that took him from his mother's womb saying, what the hell, you know, like, why, why am I out? So we are always communicating. And that creates a problem, which is everybody thinks they can do your job, right? Because, well, it's just communicating. It's just writing. Writing isn't that difficult. We all write. We all write emails. We all write letters. We all write on WhatsApp. The problem, and that sometimes creates issues, which is, for example, I can tell you stories such as, um, right, my, my, my base language is English, right? It's, it's, it's the language that I use in most of my day. However, I do understand uh, French, written French, uh, can't speak. Uh, and it's funny that sometimes we get these, uh, the text, let's, let's say the text that I, that I write in English, uh, which is technical, there's, there's technical bits, right? And it gets sent to the translator. And then the translator makes kind of like a free translation into French, for example. And then it comes back to me asking that I change the original version in English because he thinks it sounds better the way he did it. So, and this is, it's a very personal thing, communication. Unless you work in institutions which are very, uh, which have very strict guidelines and messages like this is the way to do it we have to use these words these structured uh, sentences then it's a very personal thing now i believe that we all learn with each other's like in, in communication there's no way that you unless if you can't learn with someone else then you're on the wrong uh, uh job you know it's like you can't be in communication if you're not willing to listen to what other people have has to say. You also need to be open when someone comes to you and says, someone who's not technical, let's say, right? Someone who's not a geologist, someone who's not from earth sciences and comes to me and says, I didn't understand what you've written. I didn't understand your content. Well, maybe I need to be willing to, to look at myself in the mirror and say, okay, maybe I, I, I screwed up. Maybe I didn't do it properly. Maybe I was... I, I need to think about it. Now, in my view, it's always easier to come from science towards science communication than coming from communication to science communication. Because it, it's a very, it's, it's, and I think people who are from science, from science backgrounds, hard science backgrounds, and moving towards science communication, if they have the vocation, they have their life easier. But I would say always be willing to uh, accept when someone tells you that they didn't understand and evaluate your own work and maybe put it in check that you haven't done it as you would like to. That's what I would say. Thank you, Sergio. If I can add, if I can add something in my experience, we haven't had everyone in our team with the same background. So we have people with PhDs, we had people without, and that's actually been a strength 
I don't see it as a competition at all because it means that we come in with different levels of experience, different areas that we're going to be the best at and that helps us be, that helps us work as a better team. For example, in my case, if there was a paper that was a little bit techie um, and we weren't quite sure whether to publicize it or not or what to do with it, it might come my way because I have perhaps the better tools and the better training to look at it and say, mm, actually, uh, they have this one conclusion that's really great and I think we can spin it in an interesting way. Um, and equally, we all learn from, from each other, each other's background. Maybe when my colleagues would read my press releases, they'd be able to advise if something that I feel I've put in lay language, but it's not quite there, kind of what, what Sergio was talking about with someone saying this bit right here makes sense to me. And it makes sense to me because I have all the vocabulary and my colleagues would be helping me with that. So. I don't see it as a competition at all. I see it as learning from each other. And also, it's not that it matters less because in your career progression, the PhD is part of your CV and it will always be a strength, but it's you are also then joining a different community of science communicators, PR professionals, and that also becomes your community. You just share your experience and the, the, the sort of diversity of our backgrounds is a strength. And also just to correct you, because you mentioned the Welcome Trust, I, I don't work for them yet, I start Monday, so I just want to clear that up. Oh, sorry, uh, yeah, that is we heard from Amy, yes. so yes. I, I was quite not sure if it was uh, already the case on that on Monday. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. It's actually really nice to hear that there is no competition, because in some kind of job, but so not science communication abruptly, you can have this, ah, oh, okay, I have this diploma, you don't, or stuff like that. So that's kind of great. Um, do you have another question? Well, and I believe we have to wrap up. Yes, yes. exactly, because uh, we did an hour and a half. This is basically the time we usually do our event. So thank you so much again, uh, the four of you. So Anna left, but thank you so much, Sergio, Diamond, and Renaud. It was really, really interesting. I personally had a good time. Pretty sure Anna did had one too. <laughs> uh, we are going to share uh, that in our YouTube channel uh, if you agree with it. I just want to say a little word about the London Postdoc Network. We are recruiting. So people, if you stand until the end, it's because you are interested by what we do. So please contact us. Uh, as Bruno said, you should contact now like that. You're not going to forget <laughs> for tomorrow. And uh, really, I learned a lot today. So thank you so much. For some of the initiatives, uh, like Native Scientists, I, I knew about it. I actually did participate. So I'm glad that I know some of the people that actually uh, initiated. Uh, I was part of it, at least. And um, yeah, thank you so much. We want to add. Yeah, just to thank you all for sticking for it till so late <laughs> thank you very much and i hope to see you in the next event which should be also soon yes it should be uh, after christmas after and new christmas. year's so please if you have any content you want to share with us uh sergio Renaud, uh and diamona just send that to uh, to, uh, to us sorry and we're going to share in our content as well so any of your project you want to publicize any or like you really yeah project you're really proud of please do <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for, for your time tonight. Thank you for the Thanks invitation. Everyone. Thank you. And it was really good to, to uh, uh, learn new things from, uh, from, from the invitees. Thanks very much. Thank you Thank very you. much. Bye-bye. <laughs> yeah, the, the windows here are starting to close <laughs> automatically. So I think they're also telling us that we should leave. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, uh, when we will start back the in-person events, yes. really, uh, I, I would love like invite the speakers we had during yes. all these events oh, for a drink. Event. It would be a really yes. amazing. Hope we can do that uh, the next next month. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.